Hey, welcome to Church on the Rise. We are so thrilled that you have chosen to tune in to church today. We pray the message will equip you and set you up to win your week. We pray that whatever season of life you're in, that this message will minister straight into where you need God to move the most. Look forward to seeing you after the service. Wander through the book of James uh, over the coming weeks. And I'm looking forward to that because I just think James helps us reset some fundamentals into our lives and into our walk with God that sometimes we can very easily gloss over. And today's title is uh, Tri Triumph Through Trials. Everyone say Triumph, Triumph. Through, trials. through Trials. It's very easy in our fleshly state or our human condition to assume that when we go through trials, God's gone on holiday. We go, where are you? Like, all, all my world's falling apart and I'm having a, a trial and are you still there? And sometimes it feels like every prayer you pray, your words go broop and fall flat on the floor instead of piercing through the heavens and that divine interaction and salvation comes into your trial. But God uses a trial to actually help us in our walk with him. And this morning we're going to unpack what that actually looks like. And as we go again, we're going to attend to things that maybe we've let slip. And only you will know if you've let them slip. And if you're online and you're watching, we welcome you. But only you will know if you've let them slip. And God will know if you've let them slip. And so it's important just to keep our life on show before him only. Do you know what God's ultimate goal is for you in life? Is that you would mature. Is that you'd grow in him. That it wouldn't just be a moment of, I said yes to Jesus. And then that's all I have to do. No, he wants you to grow. He wants you to mature. He wants to deepen your walk and your relationship with him. In 1997, Gary McPherson studied 157 randomly selected children and they all picked out a musical instrument that they wanted to learn. Some went on to become fine musicians and some faltered. McPherson searched for the traits that separated those who progressed from those who did not. IQ was not a good predictor. Neither were oral sensitivity, nor were math skills, income or a sense of rhythm. The best single predictor was a question McPherson had asked the students before they'd even selected their instruments. How long do you think you'll play? The students who planned to play for a short time did not become very proficient. The children who planned to play for some years had modest success. But there were some children who said, in effect, I want to be a musician. I am going to play my whole life. Those children soared. The sense of identity that the children brought to the first lesson was the spark that would set off the improvement that would subsequently happen. It was a vision of their future self. And I, I, I love that story because when we came to Jesus, assuming all in the room have, and if you haven't, then you have opportunity today to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. When you accepted Jesus, did you say, I'll give it a go. I'll see how this works for a month or two. Or did you come in and say, this is my whole life. For it's not until we actually make that commitment to Lord have it all, my whole life. I give you my whole heart, my whole life, that you begin to soar in your relationship with Jesus. And for it to become everything that you'd ever hoped or planned it to be. Christianity wasn't just something we've tried because it promised financial return on investment. It wasn't just something we gave a go because it had better health insurance. Because it was about being known by God and knowing God. Being set free from something that was holding us back, sin. We gave our whole life to our future. So that being said, let's dive into James chapter 1. 
Continue to speak to us, Lord. So I'm going to read 12 verses. So it's a bit of a chunk. It'll be on the screen. You can read along. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad among the Gentiles in dispersions, greetings, rejoice. What a great opening. Rejoice. Oh, this is a letter. James is penning here and it starts with rejoice. But then it goes <laughs> very quickly, consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever you are enveloped or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations. Be assured and understand that the trial and proving of your faith bring out endurance and steadfastness and patience. But let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play and do a thorough work so that you may be people perfectly and fully developed with no defects, lacking in nothing. Capture that verse. Memorize that verse. Read that verse over and over again because this is God's will and purpose for your life. That as you go through things and you develop endurance, steadfastness and patience and you allow it to have full work in your life, not holding anything back, not hiding anything in the closet, it'll do a thorough work all the way through, fully developed with no defects, lacking in nothing. Does anyone want that? Okay, six of us. Um, we've got some work to do. <laughs> if any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproach or fault finding and it will be given to him. Did you catch that? A lot of times we hover on, if you want wisdom, ask for it and God will give it to you liberally. Uh, we kind of paraphrase the verse. Don't paraphrase the verse. Read it in its fullness. He gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproach or fault finding. Just saying, I have a sealer. How many times do you come to God and go, well, God, I've blown it again. Therefore, I know you're not going to give me this. I know that's not going to happen. I know that's not going to work out in my life. And I know this isn't right on track. But here, when Solomon had the chance to ask God for anything, could have asked for riches, could have asked for a thousand more wives. <laughs> he asked for wisdom. Here, James is telling us, ask God for wisdom. And how does he give it? Oh, they're asking me for that again. Why? No, he doesn't say that. No, you're not good enough. You come back when you can show me your tithe. You, you come back when you show me what forgiveness looks like in your life. And yes, you can have wisdom. No, you come back when you've got all the spiritual disciplines down down pat. Oh, when was the last time you fasted seven days in a row? Not even biting anything. He doesn't say that. He says, if that's what you want, that's what you can have. Why don't you unpack this week what type of wisdom James is talking about here? For truly, oh, let's go back to number six. Only it must be in faith that he asks with no wavering, no hesitating, no doubting. For the one who wavers, hesitates and doubts is like the billowing surge out of the sea that is blown hither and thither and tossed by the wind. For truly, let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything he asks for from the Lord. What's he saying here? Ask in faith. The only thing God requires of you is faith. The only thing that pleases God is faith. Don't ask half-hearted. Don't ask going with your fingers crossed behind your back. Oh, well, maybe you will, maybe you won't. No, ask full of faith. That's what he wants. For truly, let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything he asks for from the Lord. For being as he is, a man of two minds, hesitating, dubious, irre irresolute, 
He is unstable, unreliable, uncertain about everything. He thinks, feels and decides. Let the brother in humble circumstances glory in his elevation as a Christian called to the true riches of being an heir of God. And the rich person ought to glory in being humbled by being shown his human frailty because like the flower of the grass, he too will pass away. For the sun comes up with the scorching heat and parches the grass. Its flower falls off and its beauty fades away. Even so will the rich wither and die in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed, happy to be envied, is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life for which God has promised to those who love him. What an incredible passage of scripture. Uh, This is just setting up a picture of what God actually wants for your life. The type of relationship he's wanting you to dive into. We come to understand some things as followers of Jesus. The one who died on the cross for our sin. That we were lost, but now we're found. But we're found, so let's not stay lost in our condition. God takes us as we are, but thank him that he doesn't leave us where we are. He finds us where we are, but never leaves us where we're at. He wants you to grow. His full intention for you is to grow as a Christian, to grow in his ways, in your relationship. His his intention for us isn't just to grow, but that we would grow and mature. Do you know what happens when you mature? You become seasoned through life because of experience. When you know more, you do more. When you know better, you do better. I remember when we had our first child, Charlotte. And with your first, it's almost like the whole world stops spinning. When the dummy comes out, you go looking for a steriliser machine because it's touched an unclean surface and now it must go back into the steriliser machine for 35 minutes and come out before that dummy can be put back into that child's mouth. And we try and keep the world in bubble wrap, in pristine condition because this child is the chosen one. (laughs) But then you have baby number two. It only goes in the steriliser for 15 minutes. (laughs) You have baby number three. You just dust it off, in and out. There you go, it's yours. You realise they'll survive. You realise that it's probably good for them to have a little bit of Grit and dirt and germ so they can develop some resistance to such things. God wants us to mature, but the only way we mature is going through the experience that we despise. I don't want to go through that. You're not going to learn anything. Dog, God didn't, dog, dog, God, I nearly did it again. God, you're not a dog. God wants us to grow through things. And we're going to look at that today. I love Luke 2.52. I'm excited to get this out. I I just think this this helps me. I I, I pray it helps you. Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus matured, growing up in both body and spirit, blessed by, by both God and people. If it's good enough for Jesus to grow and mature... It's good enough for us to grow and mature. Let's not become stagnant Christians. Let's allow him to teach us and to show us who we really are. What James is talking about here is a maturity and a growth that comes through the point of endurance. That point of how long will you hold on? How long will you endure? Enduring through pain and suffering. I know it's not nice. But we have to look to God in those moments. For when we're weak, he makes us strong. Enduring temptation. Do you know what that means? Knowing full well that you're being tempted. And saying no anyway. Knowing that we've tried the sin off the tree. We've, We've tripped over and taken 
that temptation. And we know we always feel worse for it. We know it never builds anything positive into our life. And in fact, it actually separates us from God. Now that we know that about temptation, if we can understand that through the maturing, we don't have to try it to know it's not good for us. There's an element to our lives that when we become aware that something's not good for us, well, I'll just see why it's not. And we try and go, oh, oh, now I know. Now I know why. But when we mature, we don't have to partake of sin to know it's not good for us. God wants us to endure. You've probably heard the age-old question, if God is good, how can he let bad things happen? Since the fall of man, life's always included hardship. Trials are painful, but we understand that the Lord's purpose can bring joy and hope. One of the things we have to come to grips with is that our growth is attached to and our maturity is attached to unpleasant times. God allows hardship in order to reveal his character. I want to, I want to say that again. Because I, sometimes I think we overlook this. God allows hardship to reveal his character. And we're going to look at scriptures and find out how those hardships work out character in our life. But I don't just want character, I want his character. And in the moment of his character being revealed, his love, his power, his sound mind being steadfast, the Lord's always steadfast in the midst of any one of our trials. I want to understand that character so I can partake that character when I go through trials. Tested faith is stronger and more reliable than untested faith. I'll say that again. Tested faith is stronger and more reliable than untested faith. Because we can say we believe one thing or a certain bunch of principles according to our faith. Do you know when our faith gets tested? When the rubber hits the road. When we have resistance. When we come across hardship. We will know the depth of our faith. Our hardship, when approached the right way, can develop God's character in us. Listen to what it says in Luke chapter 21, verse 19. By your patient endurance, you will gain your souls. By your patient endurance, you will gain your soul. It's actually an interesting passage of scripture if you want to check out the whole chapter 21. 20, 21, 22, uh, phenomenal passages of scripture talking about uh, what I believe are the days that we live in right now. Wars, threats of wars, stuff that's happening in Israel. When you look globally, uh, uh, Mark showed me an excerpt of a, a newspaper. I think there were seven different wars right around the world of what was happening here and here and here, all on the same page in the newspaper. More than ever before, It's time for us to realise what it looks like when we go through trials and challenges and to ask ourselves, how far am I willing to go to endure? Will I see it through all the way? Hebrews puts it this way. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Do you know what that's talking about? In the Old Testament, when they built the tabernacle, it was a series of inner rooms and outer rooms and outer courts. Only certain people were allowed in the outer courts. Only certain people were allowed in the next phase. And only the priest was ever allowed into the inner courts at certain times of the year. It was a place where you met the very presence of God. But thank God he sent Jesus where we all can enter in to that place of intimacy with God. See, if you'd gone into the Holy of Holies, which is that inner sanctum, and you had sin in your life, they used to tie a rope around you to drag you back out because you weren't coming back out alive. So 
uh, secure was the principle of living a righteous life before God. Jesus came in grace and in glory so that we no longer have the holy of holies where only certain ones can enter in. He made a way that we all can enter in to be one with God. One of the most fascinating things I find through this passage of Scripture is that our hardships take us to a place of intimacy with God. Have you had a moment where you thought the whole world was dismantling and falling apart? And you might have prayed a prayer like, God, if this all works out, if you come through, then I'll serve you wholeheartedly. And it comes through. And we don't really change. It's amazing how when we really need God, we somehow try and become one with God and take our intimacy to new levels. But now there's a, a place and we all have opportunity to come to that place where it's just you and God. And I want to encourage you to create that space and place in your own world, in your own day, in your own home, where it's just you and God. Will you do business with God? Will you sit in the holy of holies, your innermost place where it's uninterrupted and you allow him to put his finger on things in your life that need attention. The sad thing in modern Christendom is we've replaced with what years ago we used to say, oh, the Holy Spirit's convicting me. We'd come to a service like this and the Holy Spirit would move and the Word of God would get preached and and we'd feel the impact of that and we'd, we'd walk out going, oh, the Holy Spirit's got his finger on that in my life. Sadly, today we've replaced that with, I'm offended. How could you say that from the front? It's not me talking, it's God talking to you through me. And I pray that we would return to the days where we are so in tune with the Holy Spirit that we hear when he says, hey, attention. It's time to come back in to that one-on-one -on -one space and allow me to just work some things out in your life. The problem in, in, in this day and age is we can all think that we're one with God. Me and him, we're so tight. We're like this. And the problem if we think that too much, the Bible says to be careful that you don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. And to me, an application of that is when we think more highly that God and I are like this, number one, I think I don't need the inner holy of holies anymore. And so I don't go in and have that inspection and inquiry of God. Secondly and sadly is we actually think we've been there when we haven't. Let's create a sensitivity of heart where we never... Just think, oh, in certain times of the year, I'll go into that holy of holy place. Now, let's make it a daily visit. Let's make it a habit to say, God, it's just me and you. And if there's things that aren't right in my life, then prompt me by your Holy Spirit. I want to ask you this question. I'm asking a lot of questions today. Do you replicate in your personal walk with God what is provided for you in a service? You go, what do you mean? Well, when I go to a restaurant, uh, I have a meal prepared for me. And all I've got to do is just sit there and it gets brought to me. It's kind of like breakfast every day, really. Um, no, but I just sit there and it gets brought to me and it gets delivered and a waiter will come and he'll lay his nap this napkin over my lap and uh, would you like any more water? So it's fantastic. I love those moments. But if I don't go home and replicate what was prepared for me in my own way and in my own time, I'm not going to grow, I'm not going to fe get fed. I've actually got to go and make it happen in my own space and time. I can't live in restaurants 24-7. And so I want to ask you this question. Do you replicate in your personal walk with God what is provided for you in a church service? 
Like, like really, in a church service, it's pretty cool that the musos get to come before we do and, and they actually lead us in worship and into the presence of God and we just walk in. Like it it kind of hasn't cost us anything except getting out of bed on time, getting dressed and preparing our heart before God, but we walk in. We didn't even have to set the chairs up. It's just, it's all on. And later the coffee machine will go, rah, 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 and we'll have tea and we'll have coffee. And, we'll do and it's like being in a restaurant. But will we replicate what we're, has been done for us in our own private world? We have to now go and make it happen. I have to choose the worship set. I have to open my word. I have to sit and prayerfully consider, God, what are you saying for me? And I want to suggest to you, in the, in the modern cry of revival, and I want revival like the next guy. But let's be careful that we, we don't just want what's done publicly. Oh, yeah, I'll go to that meeting. Oh, it's a revival meeting. Oh, I'll just walk into it. And it won't cost me anything. And I'll, when I'm done and tired, I'll go home. And then I'll go back. And then I'll go home. But well, my question is, will you replicate what's put on for you privately? Because to me, that's revival. Revival for me is, Lord, do in me. Don't do for me. Do in me. And all that other will take care of itself. But it's about endurance and sustaining what God wants to do. James 1.12, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. Why? Because there's a lesson to be learned in the trial. Not just a lesson, but an experience to behold, to take you to a new level. I want to ask you this question this morning. Do you want to endure in your marriage? If you want to endure in your marriage, I want you to stand up right now. Do you want to endure in your finances? If you want to endure in your finances, I want you to stand up right now. If you want to endure in your walk with God, I want you to stand up right now. Father God, this is the heart of your people. We're not here for a quick fix. We're not here just to see how it goes. Lord, we're here to endure. We want to endure in our marriages. We want to endure in our finances. We want to endure in our workplaces. We want to endure in our relationships. Lord, for your glory. Lord, that you would move so powerfully in each one of us individually that corporately, Lord God, we wouldn't be able to contain what it is that you want to do. Break down the walls. Like that song we sang, Lord, break down the walls in our lives where we've said, no, you can't have access to that, Lord. Break down the walls where we've put up resistance, Lord Jesus, that we would come and meet in that holy place for you to outwork your will and purpose through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can take your seats. I, lo I love Romans chapter 5. Uh, God just wants you to endure. If you're having challenges in your marriage, realize uh, the endurance is you're not identical. Men think different to how women think. Not, not on topics, just in general. <laughs> we, we, just, uh, we think differently. Has anyone worked that out in your marriage? <laughs> and so if we're different, then we have to give more grace rather than diving in, but can't you see it my way? No, they can't. And they probably won't. But you know what happens when you allow grace to enter in? God will grace you enough grace to see it their way, not make them see it yours. And that going ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, saying things we don't mean to try and hurt the other person isn't going to get anywhere near solving it. Do you know how you'll solve, you, you won't have any arguments, I'll guarantee, this is how you have no arguments in your marriage. 
Simple question. How can I help you win in this situation? How can I help you win? Well, it might start with you saying sorry. Oh, okay. I'm really sorry. Now, I've worked this out in marriage. You can be happy or you can be right. <laughs> uh, right gets you the couch. <laughs> oh, you can be right. Well, you can be happy. <laughs> happy is I'm going to lay me down. So I can lift you up. You know, men, we have a role to play in loving our wives. We're to love our wives as Christ loves the church. He laid his life down for the church. He adorns his wife. His words evoke her beauty. We have a responsibility. Wives, you have a responsibility in the marriage to honour your husbands. That word honour doesn't mean just do what he says. It means to esteem and to lift up and to come under and together work out a way of how we're going to forge this life and relationship for the glory of God. This is how we mature, church. To mature, I have to lay me down so that he can be lifted up. In Romans chapter 5, uh, one of my favourite passages, it talks about moving from powerless to powerful. And I'm going to read the chunk. Therefore, since we are justified, given right standing with God through faith, let us grasp the fact that we have peace of reconciliation to hold and to enjoy peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anything more beautiful than that? God wants you to have peace. Through him, we also have access, entrance into faith, into this, by faith, into this grace, state of God's favour, in which we firmly and safely stand. And let us rejoice and exult in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. God wants you to enjoy his glory. That comes with peace. Moreover, let us also be full of joy now. Let us exult and triumph in our trouble. Everyone say trouble. trouble. And rejoice, say rejoice. rejoice, in our sufferings, knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patient and unswerving endurance. And endurance and endurance develops maturity of character, approved faith and tried integrity. And character of this sort produces the habit of joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. Such hope never disappoints or deludes or shames us, for God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. While we were yet in weakness, powerless to help ourselves, at the fitting time Christ died for in behalf of the ungodly, which makes us powerful. When you, when you read on the next couple of verses, it, you, you just begin to see that God doesn't want you powerless. He wants you powerful. So that when you go through the trial and you've learned what it means to endure and stand and be tested, that your faith being purified brings glory to God, strengthens your experience and takes you deeper. It's a process called sanctification where we become more and more like Christ over a period of times as things get worked and outworked in our lives. Billy Graham told the story of his wife who was actually travelling down the road and she came across all these signs saying detour, turn this way, turn that way, go down this way and after quite a few kilometres comes back around and she sees the sign, end of construction, thank you for your patience. Well, Mrs Graham got the chuckles 
And she came home and she happily told the story to her family and said, I've worked out what I want written on my gravestone when I die. End of construction. <laughs> Each life is made up of mistakes and learning, twisting and turning, waiting, growing, practicing patience and being persistent. And at the end of construction, death, we've completed the process. But this process, as the Word of God says that we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, and we'll behold his glory. Of only knowing in part now, we will know then in full. And I look forward to that day. But there's some business to attend to before that happens. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I've entitled just this simple passage, Direction and Correction. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God and woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This only takes place as we allow ourselves to be directed by God and corrected by God or corrected by God so he can then direct us. It's Holy Spirit guide me. When we soar to the lofty heights of I am one with Jesus, me and him, we're tight, we're close, just remember that that connection, that oneness with God will be reflected in your conduct with other people. When you go into your Holy of Holies, don't have such a wow time with God that you forget like you're living on planet Earth. You've heard the saying that we can become so spiritually significant we're of no earthly good. We're still here. So remember who you are. Remember that your oneness with God will be reflected in your conduct with other people. That sometimes is a test and a trial. How are you going to respond when someone's harsh? Someone honks the horn at the traffic lights. Mark, come on, get a wriggle on, keep it moving. Your submission, your language, your conduct, your cooperation, your serving. It never ends, but it's seen through every action and every reaction. And that when you catch yourself reacting in a particular way, let that be an indicator that says, oh, time to go back into the holies of holies. And I hope you didn't just come out of there. <laughs> Oop, come back in. Oop. Correction keeps you moving forward. It's actually for our benefit when we're corrected because it teaches us what the right thing to do is. And God's will teaches us what, our word teaches us what the right thing to do is. And you read it in other translations. It's like it straightens us out. God's word, it'll straighten us out. It'll show us what's right with our lives and what's wrong with our lives and as we keep that softness before God allowing him to speak into those areas that we may not be too au fait with having someone else speak into but you know what I found that when I've been corrected by someone over me it hurts it's uncomfortable but when I approach it with humility I no longer have to defend myself. I just simply have to humble myself and say, okay, this is how we do it now. Okay, I can learn from this. I can grow from this. That correction isn't to keep you small. Sometimes we think that when we correct something or being corrected, oh, they're trying to push me down. They're trying to keep me small. No, it's to make you big. It's to increase your footprint. To increase what you could possibly do and give to others in this world. God wants to grow you and to mature you and the more mature you are, you learn to how to handle correction and direction. I, I love this thought. The Australian coat of arms pictures two creatures, the emu, a flightless bird, and the kangaroo. The animals were chosen because they share a characteristic 
that appeal to Australian citizens. Both the emu and the kangaroo can move only forward, not back. The emu's three-toed foot causes it to fall if it tries to go backwards. And the kangaroo is prevented from moving in reverse by its large tail. That's why you never put, get a kangaroo in a corner. <laughs> He's going to move forward. Those who truly choose to follow Jesus become like the emu and the kangaroo, moving only forward, never back. In Luke chapter 9, 62, it says, No one who puts a hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Where do we want to go? We want to go forward. What do we want to build? We want to build our lives on the word of God. Through his teaching and his prompting in us. Understand this, Proverbs 3.12 says, The Lord disciplines the one he loves, as does a father in the son in whom he delights. So if there's correction, allow it to be direction. Remember those times when you have little toddlers and you're coming up to cross the road and you're sort of like back, <laughs> look left, look right, look left again. Or is it the other way? And anyway, just look. But how in a moment of no understanding, your children just get excited because we're going over the road and just run across. I thank God for the numerous occasions that some of our children just ran across. There was no car coming. And your heart's in your mouth. But if you never correct it, you're never able to direct it. Just make sure you're correcting and you're directing. Never come from a point of frustration. You know, when, when God gives us wisdom, he's ungrudging. doesn't want to hold anything back. But the right lesson given in the right way is always learned. A lesson given in frustration is quickly forgotten. Or resistance enters the fault. Well, I'm not doing it that way. Well, I want you to do it that way. Well, I'm not doing it that way. And you get the jowls going. Whereas if it's gentle, I just think we could try it this way. Well, I'll give it a go. Oh, yeah, do it this way. One of our children turned into a tornado when they were a lot younger if I got them out of bed a particular way. If I got them out of bed in the particular way of, I've told you five times, get out of bed, it's time to get moving, there's more than you in this family and we've got to get moving. Enter the hurricane and the tornado. Cereal from one end of the kitchen to the other. On the floor, everywhere in between, spillage. And the poor child gets ready in a grump. And then I learned a lesson. It's not about being right, it's about being happy. It's about a young spirit being nurtured and encouraged. I found I didn't like tornadoes. I didn't want a storm every morning. So I tried a different approach. Hey, buddy. I know I've woken you up a couple of times, time to get up now. You got up? There's no tornado. It's a fine day. The birds are chirping. It's incredible. Who learnt the lesson? I learnt the lesson. It's not about being right, it's about being happy. It's about lifting up, not squashing down. Correction and direction are to make people bigger. Not hold them in a holding pattern. Well, you'll never go past this until you... No, no, no. You've got to see the bigger picture. You've got to come and see what I can see. A farmer once had a, an eagle land on his property and he loved the eagle. And so what he did is he hobbled it. And he put, then put it in his chicken coop and it actually learnt to be like a chicken. And it scrammed around off the floor until... One day a shepherd came down from the mountains and he said to the farmer, why do you have an eagle in your chicken coop? He said, oh, I love eagles. 
but they weren't created to do this. So the shepherd went and took the eagle and unshackled it and the farmer said, you know, you're right. And they unshackled it and they put it high on the wall and the eagle began to see what it couldn't see down in the chicken coop was the big blue sky, a land beyond. The eagle stood on the wall and opened its wings to its fullest extension and then took off and just began to soar and go higher and higher and higher. That's what God wants for your life. Never think, oh, correction, he's just trying to keep me small. No, it's so that you will learn how to serve, that you will learn how to push things forward in the right direction, not looking back, growing and maturing and becoming the person he's called you to be without fault, without defect. But that's what he wants for your life. Nothing holding you back. Come on, let's stand as we close. Because I've got another two hours worth of notes here, so I think we should <laughs> just finish. This excites me. We're going to unpack James and over the coming weeks and I just hope and pray that as you lean into this that you begin to, to get a freshness about where God wants to lead you in, in your life, in your marriage, in your ministry, with your children. And when you take on his character, you see that his way is better than our ways. Come on, why don't we just lift our hands to heaven? Father God, in this moment and in this space, Lord, we ask that your word would become our words, that your ways would become our ways. Lord, that we'd be done with trying to figure it all out on our own, but that we'd come and we'd submit and humbly rest in your leading and your guiding. Lord, that we'd position ourselves in your word. Lord, that we'd keep taking steps of faith. Lord, help us to remember that in every trial, Lord, your will and purpose is to enlarge us, is to grow us, that we could help grow those around us through our experience. Father God, we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honour for what you're doing in our lives, for what you're doing in our church. Take us from strength to strength. Build line upon line, brick upon brick, precept upon precept. Lord, that you'd be glorified in and through our lives for your name's sake. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hey, thanks for being with us today at Church on the Rise. We pray that you've gleaned something from the message that will actually help you in your walk with Jesus. If today you're making a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, please drop us a line at wecare at cotr.org.au. We'd love to help you, give you resources, tips, tools, and walk with you in your discipleship journey. We pray God's best over you for the week ahead.